we go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Data Diversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will talk about data quality best practices and joined by guest speaker, Nigel Turner. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of, screen, of the screen to activate that feature. And for questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DA strategies. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and additional information throughout, requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce our series speaker, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. And joining Do Donna today is Nigel Turner, the Principal Information Management Consultant for EMEA at Global Data Strategy. Nigel has over 20 years of experience in information management with specialization in information strategy, data quality, data governance, and master data management. He has created and led large IM and CRM consultancy and delivery practices in multiple consulting organizations, including British Telecom Communications Group, IPL, and FHO. Nigel is well-known thought leader in information management and has presented at many international conferences in, additional, in addition to writing numerous papers and blogs on information management topics. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon. Hello, everyone, for joining. Thanks again. It's always nice to see some familiar names. Um, and for those of you who might be your first uh, time joining us, um, and the, one of the common questions we get is, will this be recording? And yet, yeah, recorded, yes. So we'll have this recorded on Data Diversity, I think, in perpetuity, if you want to keep listening to it again. Um, or if any of those other topics earlier in the year were of interest to you, they are all on demand, both the slides and the actual recording. Um, and then please join us for any of the upcoming um, sessions later this year. So um, without further ado, to get into the topic of today is data quality. Um, so we had a lot of resistance today because this is always a popular topic, unfortunately, because no matter how long we've been in data, there's always, well, because data keeps changing, right? There's always data improvement issues that we can, we can focus on. And what we want to focus on today, and, and Nigel and I do a lot of this in our day job at Global Data Strategy, is really how do you look holistically at data quality prob problems um, and not just do sort of a one-off cleaning um, effort. And so, you know, kind of the analogy we use a lot is, you know, you can clean up the, 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 the pond, um, but if the streams going into the pond are still putting in dirty, dirty water, <laughs> you're still going to have an issue. And, and that's really what it is like with data quality, a one-time cleanup is not going to fix the holistic pro uh, problem. And the holistic problem, and we'll talk a lot about this, um, and that's what's so tricky about, uh, tricky but also rewarding about data quality, is, is that it's not just a technical problem, like many things in, in data, um, but it's people, it's process, it's, it's as well as technology. So is, is it the business process itself that's causing the, the data issues? Is it a, a badly designed data model or a poorly defined definition? You know, all of the above. And so we'll, we'll be touching that throughout the session today. Um, and if you've joined our webinar before, you probably are familiar with this framework that we always use um, because anything, I can say this about any topic, data quality in particular is one that is particularly multifaceted and touches a lot of these areas. Um, but you can say this about anything. Um, you know, if you don't have good data quality, is it because you don't have a great data governance in place? Is there ownership over that data? Do you have a culture of data quality in your organization to really promote data? Is it, as I mentioned before, is there a poor architecture on data quality. Don't get me started. This is where I do feel like I've been around for over 20 years over the, the data quality rant. So, you know, something as simple as could a customer have more than one address? Or, you know, that's a data quality rule that uh, could be fixed in the data model. Um, as well as things of, you know, do we have duplicates? Could master data management solve that? So we really need to look holistically across all of that. And then one of the things we always focus on at um, Global Data Strategy and our, our engagement is I'm just going to pause for a second. There's a lot of background noise. I'm not sure if it's not on mute. Um, I might want to go on mute. If, 
uh, not speaking. So um, is the, the key to all of this is to focus on the business strategy. And I know that's obvious, <laughs> um, but all of us, all of us, um, myself included, sometimes forget this, e either in the eagerness to, to fix something quickly, because, oh, I know I could just fix this, just give me a minute, or, or to play around with the tech that you want to play with, or maybe we don't see the big picture. But key with data quality, and we'll talk a lot about this, is really focusing on the right problem, getting the right stakeholders involved, and then making sure you do a bit of marketing around the benefits. And so that's another thing that we'll talk a lot about. Um, but before you even do the data quality cleaning, um, have you quantified any, any harm that's been done by the data quality or even better, any opportunity that could be generated by cleaning up the data quality and look at both of those. And then when you do the quality over time, um, really keeping track of that. That is one of the nice things about data quality as part of this entire framework is that it's, it's actually very rewarding. It's easier to qu quantify than some of these other more um, you know, nebulous areas, and it's easier to show the results. Often when we do a data strategy, one of the quickest wins we do look at, and sort of especially when we're trying to tie it to ROI, is some sort of data quality cleaning up, cleaning up customer data for a marketing campaign, or you know, or, or solving issues with mailing based based on bad addresses. You know, there's so much that can be very rewarding as a quick win. So we're going to talk more about that. I'm going to pass it over um, to Nigel. One of the, the interesting things, kind of the fun things, we can go out and get a whole session just on this. And we all, especially if you're in data, actually my family starts doing it. You go to the store and something's wrong, and you you know back you know, the customer experience was bad because of a data quality issue. Um, uh, one member of my family went to the bank the other day and there was a problem. And I told him that they had bad master data, and that's why it was wrong. So we all have these. So in context, I'm going to pass it over to Nigel um, to share some of his data quality stories and, and kind of put this in context. Okay. Uh, well, and, uh, hello, everybody. And I, as Donna, as Chapman said earlier, I've been in uh, information management for 25 years and started with data quality. So it's always been my sort of primary passion in the information management space. And I think there are still a lot of common misconceptions around about data quality. Donna's already touched on one of them, which is that it sometimes seems a sort of slightly odd, off to the left discipline of data management. It actually isn't. I think it's fundamental and embedded, if you like, in many of the others. You know, we all know you can't have good BI without good data quality. You can't have accurate, predictive analytics if the book, the core data that you're working with isn't, isn't accurate. So it's not a standalone discipline. It depends on other disciplines, but also many dis disciplines depend on it. <clears throat> I think a more common misperception is the second one, which is that there are still a lot of people out there, unfortunately, who think that data quality is first and foremost a problem for the IT department. And what that then does is it encourages people in organizations to think, well, if it's an IT problem, IT can solve it. Let's buy some data quality tools and let's try and apply them somewhere and it'll, all the problems will go away. Um, but as Donna said already, that is really the case. I think every single data quality problem I've come across in organizations, and I've come across a few in the last 25 years, are usually caused by process people and IT usually the three things simply not working well together. So if you're gonna fix that particular specific data quality problem, any solution that you come up with must, as Donna said earlier, be holistic. And it also has to be driven by the business because if you're going to change the way that people behave or change business processes, then the only people who are able to do that is the business, not the IT department. I think another common misconception about data quality, which I've heard in many organizations, you need to improve the quality of your data. Yeah, I know, but we've got a lot of other priorities at the moment, and we maybe will think about that next year when we sorted out the problems that we currently got. Of course, the problem is um, data quality improvement isn't a, isn't a choice, uh, because I'll give you an example. I mean, let's say I'm a billing clerk and I work in an invoice department, and I'm just about to send an invoice to a client, pull up the information on screen and notice that half the address is missing. So what do I do? I may go back to an old invoice and hope I can, I can retrieve the address from there. If I can't find an old invoice, I have to get in touch with the sales department and the sales department might go through their records and then eventually you might come up with a decent address so you can actually invoice the customer. Now that is data quality improvement. It's just a really inefficient way of doing it. And um, what would happen in that case, you waste a lot of business time and hence money. Um, you delay probably the production of the invoice and therefore you delay payment. 
And we're still, the next time that happens, you've got to go through the whole process all over again. So I don't think data quality improvement is a choice. It's not a choice about if you do it, it's how you do it. And what we're going to try and suggest in this webinar are ways in which you can be proactive about data quality so that you fix your model, your paradigm, from one where you're fighting fires all the time because your data's poor, to one where you're engaged in fire prevention. You're anticipating the problems, you're fixing them before they happen, and it stops fires breaking out. And then finally, um, data quality improvement. Uh, some people think it's a project. As Donna said, you know, we've got a problem with our marketing database. What should we do is do a data cleanse. And you do a data cleanse and nothing else. And then you do another project a year later to do another data cleanse and yet another data cleanse. That's not proper data quality management. That's simply data cleansing and a cost of failure to the business. So basically, data quality improvement may start with projects, and we'll, we will certainly show you how you would do that. But if you're going to get a handle on data quality in, in a permanent sense in an organization, then you must develop processes and organizational structures that tackle data quality as a business as usual activity. Because your data is always changing, your business is always changing, so the challenge of managing data quality doesn't have a start and an end, it just continues. So what, what exactly do we mean by data quality? Um, being simple people, um, we, we go for simple definitions. And uh, this is ours. It's simply the data that is demonstrably fit for purpose. So what does that actually mean? Um, I think the first thing demonstrably means that you can't control and, and manage data quality if you can't measure it. And I know that's one of the oldest cliches in data management, but for data quality, it's more true than for any other discipline, I think. Um, the other thing that it implies as well is that any data quality improvement that you do must be directly aligned with business outcomes. So, for example, you know, if, the example I gave earlier, if you've got poor data in your marketing database and you put some things, some steps in place to improve the quality of the data, you need to be able to relate that to business outcomes, i.e., in this case, better marketing success, more revenues, for example. Otherwise, what's the point of cleaning it? Data quality is never an end in itself. It's a means to business improvement. And fit for purpose also implies something, which is that there isn't an organization anywhere in the world, I, I, I would venture, who has got data quality cracked. No one has 100% data quality in every single system or platform that they operate. So it's the business that must decide how good the data needs to be. And for different purposes, different quality of data would be acceptable. So a marketing data, data um, uh, email, for example, doesn't need to be of such high quality maybe as an invoice, because you want to make sure on the invoice that you've got it right. And it must be the business that defines that. So if you're a good organization with data quality, then all your data meets that definition. But unfortunately, there are many organizations out there that are a long way from that. And I'm a bit of a data quality nerd, so I've collected a few horror stories. And I'll keep these pretty brief. Um, in, let's take the first one, January 2020. Um, a UK insurance company made headline news in the UK for all the wrong reasons, because it decided to send a marketing email to everybody on its contact base, and that amounted to more than uh, two or three million customers. And unfortunately, every single email they sent started Dear Michael. Now, of course, that wouldn't have been a problem if they'd sent it to Michael Caine, if he happened to be a, a client of that particular company, but I suspect he wasn't. Um, and, of course, when it hit the headlines, the company was approached and they explained it on a temporary technical error, which is a classic non-explanation for poor management of data quality. It's always the fault of some technical thing somewhere, rather than some, some intelligent uh, vetting process to make sure these things can't happen. And of course, yeah, that was a bit of a laugh and everybody had some fun, but then it got a bit more serious because then people started to contact this insurance company and said, well, if you make mistakes like this with data, how do I know that you're not sending my policy information to the wrong customers? And as a result of that, they've lost a significant number of customers because of that one error. And that's pretty bad, but if you look at the second example I've got, which is again from my home uh, country, the UK, uh, back in 2018, a retail bank undertook a customer data migration, and they decided to do it over a weekend, thinking that would minimize impact on customers. And they did it, and they migrated 5 million of their customers to a new platform. And on the following Monday after the weekend, um, the outcome was, to put it very briefly, two of the 5 million customers couldn't access their accounts at all. 
Um, but you think that was bad enough, but it got worse than that because many customers who could access accounts actually discovered they were accessing accounts that weren't theirs. And, and the more worse still, they could actually move money from those accounts to other accounts. And so fraud, the fraudsters got hold of this very quickly. And millions of pounds worth of money was siphoned off from customers' accounts. And the reason I put a date in November on that, a major report came out in the UK. And the outcome of that, that mess, which was caused by the fact that they didn't bother to profile or analyze the data before they did that migration, um, they lost 80,000 customers. And to pay the customers the compensation uh, for their accounts being siphoned off and to fix the problem that's been caused, cost that company $480 million at the end of the day. And as a result of that, the CEO was sacked. And the whole IT department who were, who were blamed for the fiasco actually were sacked and they, they outsourced all their IT to a third party. So that's probably the, the most expensive data quality error I think that I'm aware of. And then bringing it more up to date, we're all aware, I'm sure, of COVID. And the UK government sent out a whole bunch of letters, nearly a million letters to people who were regarded as vulnerable and therefore needed to shield themselves during the lockdown. Unfortunately, although they sent them to a million people, they later discovered that 600,000 people were not contacted as part of that original uh, letter circulation. And then of the letters that were sent out, 17% of them were sent to the wrong addresses, which meant that people who should have shielded didn't shield, and people who shouldn't have shielded were told to shield. So that, again, was a bit of a catastrophe and destroyed, I think critically, destroyed confidence in the UK governments involved at the time where they most needed the support and the confidence of their people. And I put this one in because Donna always does. And I told you, uh, my photograph unfortunately comes up again. And I've been, uh, had a UK pharmacy loyalty card since 2012. Uh, and even after eight years, they are still convinced that I'm female and not a male. Despite the fact that I've emailed them on frequent occasions, they still keep sending me stuff that says Miss Nigel Turner. And I still get lots of cosmetics offers. Um, so I'm in a mascaras, foundations, and everything else to do with cosmetics. He does look nice. Yeah, and that's why I look so good at <laughs> my age. I was going to say thank you, Donna. And, uh, but basically, uh, yeah, basically they still haven't got that right. So I miss out all the offers that I'm interested in. I get offers that I'm not interested in even after eight years. So what's the, what's the impact of errors such as this? If you take the, the sort of uh, industry as a whole, um, then the poor data quality impacts both companies and it impacts individuals. And I think some of the examples, I mean, the, the bank one is probably the prime one, can have a massive economic impact. If your marketing data is poor, your marketing will be poor, and so it will affect your revenues. If you are constantly reworking data because it, the data can't be trusted in your core systems, that costs the company money. And uh, Both, of course, if you increase costs and you decrease revenues, then your profits go down. Um, it, I think the examples will show you as well that it impacts brand and customer loyalty. That if, if customers don't trust you with their data, and customers are much more savvy than they used to be about this, then your brand can be damaged and you can lose customers. And of course, we all know about the increasing law and regulation. I mean, in Europe, of course, GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, is now law in all countries in Europe. And of course, if you work in a regulated sector, such as banking or insurance or telecommunications, there will be specific regulations as well that, that control how good your data needs to be. And you might need to prove to these regulators that you have done the right things with data. So if your data quality is poor, you are increasing the risk and exposure of your organization. But it's not just the damage, it's, it's not just for companies, it, it's also, of course, for individuals. So I think personal harm, um, you know, the COVID example is a very good one. To give you another one very close to home, I have an uncle who applied for a mortgage and was denied, um, not because there was anything wrong with his credit record, but he discovered eventually after many complaints that the organization concerned mixed him up with somebody who had the same name as him and mistook him for this person who had a bad credit record. So he was actually personally damaged by that. Um, it can cause annoyance, of course, as well. You know, I'm, I'm sure all of us have had letters or emails from organizations that can't even spell our name right. And therefore, that's hardly going to encourage us to buy things or do business with a company. And I think what's changed in data quality in the, uh, since the advent of social media as well 
is that in the past, companies could sweep data quality problems under the carpet. They can't anymore because, you know, people, if they, if, if they feel they've been badly treated or their data has been badly managed by an organization, they tell other people. And there are lots of cases now of things going viral where somebody has made a complaint about an organization, put it out in social media, and before you know it, there are hundreds of thousands of people doing exactly the same thing and really causing big problems for that organization. So that's, that's the, the scope and scale of the problem that still exists with data quality. So what Donna's now going to do is we'll start to talk you through how we think you can fix these problems. Donna. Great. So I'm sure a lot of us can relate to the stories Nigel has told because we all unfortunately live these things day to day. And it always amazes me after as many years in the business as I am that companies are still having these issues, right? But it is complicated. And and, and to solve it, um, and there's been a lot of chat in, in the discussion on this very topic of, you know, isn't data quality like MDM? Isn't it like governance? Isn't it like, yes, <laughs> it really takes a holistic approach. And how we like to look at it is that it really is a combination of people technology and business process, um, which I guess is a combination of people and technology, right? But if, if we even look at the people, I mean, uh, with their governance in place, I mean, some of the examples that Nigel talked about, some of the customers we've, we've, we've worked with to help, help clean things up, you, you sort of wondered, why did this happen? Did, did not a person check in? And was anyone accountable for this issue? And that's part of the problem. If nobody owns it, nothing gets done. Some of the other um, pieces in the, some of the chat mentioned, is it training? Do people know the right business rules even to put in? Some person's stressed, they're in the front line, they need to enter some data, they, they put it in. Do they understand the importance of that data? Or even better, could you automate those business rules uh, straight into the front end applications, especially with things like ma master data? Can you have you know the beauty of a drop down, right? <laughs> if we can, uh, I actually, I tell this joke all the time. I was registering for a data quality webinar with somewhere, <laughs> um, and then the, the US state code was a free form text. And that's a really nerdy sort of joke, but it's true um, because what better way to have bad data quality, you know, to not even have just a simple list of the valid values, right? So a lot of that people problem it can be alleviated by tech and can be alleviated by training and can be alleviated by understanding. I mean, part of it, a lot of this is what, what might be rules from one department might be used differently in, in another department. So or do we have aligned business rules? Um, you know, that famous, I used this field because it was empty and I, I put something else in it because I, I needed a place for it, right? So really getting those business rules aligned and then aligning them to governance so we have that holistic view. That does align with business process. That sort of is a very nice analogy to the, are we cleaning the, the streams going into the pond? Um, you know, what caused these, these business, uh, the data quality issues, what business processes could be better managed? Um, the people who are, see one part of the process, the person inputting the data may not be the person using the data, right? So we can we take a holistic look. Um, and also, you know, even the process of data management. Um, always amazed one of the big data quality issues was one of our retail companies. This was two years ago. <laughs> um, one of the DBAs decided to change the, the field length of the product code. Um, probably a lot of you are cringing and shortened it from 10 characters to eight for some reason, brought down their retail system. Again, millions of dollars lost, customer reputation, all of that. And that was really just data management, best practices, lifecycle management, right? So we'll talk a lot about the business side. I think that's an easier way to think about data quality and there's the impact, but some of this is just basic housekeeping on the back end, right? That, that shouldn't happen. Um, and then technology, of course, um, we're here at Diversity because we probably love data and we love tech. And there are tools, we're not gonna talk about tools, there are, quote, pure play data quality tools that can help, as Nigel mentioned, automate a lot of this cleansing, do data augmentation, they're great, they have a purpose. But really, to look holistically around what's a data quality tool, you really need to look fully at data architecture. What was the data modeling tool to get those business roles aligned into the database, right? Do you have an MDM tool to really help automate a single version of the truth? Is the tool, again, the front-end system that has the right drop-downs that integrates with MDM, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you do need to augment data quality with technology. I mean, no, I mean, you could be writing everything on pencil and paper. Um, but really we're using technology for this. So they all have to be integrated and you can't look at any of them in a vacuum. So that can sound daunting. Um, often these problems are large um, and they are complex. And Nigel will talk more about that in a bit, but we work a lot with complexity and I've found anyone who does work with complexity keeps it very 
simple, right? I, I'm in a stressful situation. What are my, my key things I need to remember? So we, we thought kind of a nice way to look at it would kind of be the, the ABCs, right? Just a simple sort of five-step approach. And mnemonics are always nice to remember, remember things. Um, so kind of thinking of the ABCDE is kind of a, a maybe a helpful way to look at it. Uh, so we always do these steps, whether we call it this or not. <laughs> um, that's really up to you, but it's a nice way to kind of look at it. So first, assess any situation that you're in and you need to understand a, a solution, stop for a second and think. And, and really, what are what is the, the business value of this? Is it, is it even a problem? What's the priority? What's the impact? Um, as Nigel mentioned, every company um, has data quality issues, and that's actually not a problem. I mean, I'm a big old data nerd. You all know that. Um, and um, here in our own company, I <laughs> you can probably appreciate this. Some people call, I often have to stop with cleaning data. I'll say, you know, here's a, a, a set of data we're just using for a one-off, you know, event or something. I don't need every field to be correct, right? Because if you did that, no one would ever get anything else done in the, in, in, in the organization, right? So you really have to prioritize. As Nigel mentioned, is this going to send an invoice out to help us get paid? Or is it just something that we're, we're using for a draft and it's going to be thrown away? So um, especially us uh, OCD types that probably want to fix everything sometimes. You know, most, most people have to look at it the other way. We need to clean things. Some of us have to not clean things, depending on how you look at it. But both are valid. Um, and then baseline. And, and Nigel mentioned it. We'll mention it again. It may be trite, but it's true. You can't manage what you can't measure. So where are we today and where do we want to go? Is it, you also want to be realistic. Even your high priority invoice data, there is probably a good enough there. And, and that's defined by the business. And so often when we work with data governance, the business defines what's your goal. Is it 90% accuracy, 100%? You know, maybe it's health data. I, I hope my, my doctor knows which leg to operate on, right? You don't want any error there. <laughs> um, um, but really, that, that's what you need to baseline. And don't forget that. Again, we've all made these types of mistakes, but probably in our eagerness to get it fixed, oh, I can fix that. Stop. See how bad it is now. Make that baseline. And then when you do improve it, you can, you can show folks how far you went. We often forget that with any, any kind of project. Um, converge. How do, we, how do we prioritize? As I mentioned, what's the biggest value? And then give a little thought on how we divine, de develop those improvements. Is it a people? Is it a process? Is it a tech? Again, a lot of us on the, on the call probably go right to the tech. Sometimes it's training. Sometimes it's just changing the business process and there's absolutely no tech involved. And that can be as valid if not more of a solution. And then again, don't forget, we, we often do this as well, we're busy, we go on to the next thing. A, stop and, and, and show the ROI. And then again, if you want to get more buy-in, um, tell everybody about that ROI. There's a bit of evangelism there. And then don't forget, as, as Nigel mentioned, and we'll, we'll mention again, this isn't a one-time thing. So you cleaned it up and you're not done. How do you integrate that with an ongoing business as usual activity so that this is just part of your DNA in the company um, and you don't, you don't forget about it moving on? So uh, as we'll go through each of these steps in a little more detail and, and hopefully give you, I mean, gosh, each of these steps could be a whole webinar. But um, again, we do this in a lot of the webinars. So just enough kind of the takeaway, hopefully give you some ideas of maybe a couple of things you're, you may not be doing or to put some thoughts in your head. So again, what is the business, the business landscape? What, what is the organization trying to do? Are you a healthcare organization and you're trying to do health, telehealth and want to make sure it's accurate? Are you a marketing organization and you want to sell more widgets to customers, right? The, the goals are, are important. Um, analyze where you are today and who are the primary stakeholders? Who are the parties that are going to be involved in both fixing it and consuming it? Um, and then understand it, as Nigel mentioned, this idea of fitness for purpose. What's, what does the goal need to be? What's working well? What needs to be improved? And then again, do document it. Not, there are fancy ways to do things like data quality issue log. Uh, I've seen some tools be scrolling by in the chat. Tools are great, but a good old spreadsheet might be something to start with even. Right? But just document. Don't, don't forget to list the, and prioritize some of the issues. So some of the tools you can use to, to prioritize uh, what that impact is. So I, again, so much value just doing some simple uh, documentation. Do you have a list of the stakeholders? We spend a lot of time on any engagement. Who who cares uh, about this? Who's impacted by this? Who is influential in solving this? Um, spend a lot of time on that and really look at, at how those people are using the data. And then how are you going to communicate um, to those people? We use a lot in our practice pictures, right? Because a picture's worth a thousand words, um, and people can start to relate to their own problem. So really tell the story in a real world issue. So it's a bit of um, 
qualitative and quantitative. Everyone can can understand an anecdote. Remember last year when we had this or, or you know, the stories Nigel just told, everyone can relate to stories, but then back it up with evidence. And here's the re remember we had that embarrassing thing where we sent out the emails um, to all Michaels. Well, this is how much it cost the company. And this was our reputation loss, et cetera, et cetera. Our net promoter score went down, right? The more you can do both. And then uh, my favorite business data models and process models. Draw out that flow. Explain. I have just whiteboarded a data model with some of the in five minutes with some of these issues um, of, of why the data structure might have caused some of these issues. Or, or have a collaborative session. Link that with your process model. Where in the process did things break down? What was the human in the loop or, or what was automated? And then again, do some initial ROI of quantifying the problem and also quantifying the opportunity. But we'll talk a little bit about, more about this as well, but we often, it's so easy to call out the problems, right? But, and we did an example where when you think of the stakeholders, don't just make this an IT issue. Get some, if, if, you're an, if you are an IT person on the call, Get some business people to be your co-champions and align. And, and can they, again, when we talk about governance and accountability, can they put themselves in the line too to say, yes, we're going to be accountable. So one of the examples we had, um, we actually went to get funding and approval and all of that with the marketing department. And we'd done the uh, analysis together with them. And we said, not only can we, you know, solve these issues, the, the ones that Nigel, types that Nigel mentioned, um, but we can, we will commit that if we can clean up this data, we will have a, 12% increase in our campaign, um, you know, click through rate, and that will generate X amount in revenue. And we will commit to that. Uh, or, you know, and we, we obviously were a little bit conservative, so we could make it. But again, that speaks volumes. That shows that direct link to the business um, with data quality and opportunity as well. We can make more money with better data quality. It isn't always about avoiding risk. Uh, you can use data opportunity as well. Um, so I kind of mentioned we we can have more examples also of the ROI and we will. But sometimes you and I have done this. We do a lot of work with the C level, and sometimes it's just getting that right anecdote, the right story, having it hit home. And, and pictures and stories do great um, with this. So I'm going to pass it over to Nigel to kind of show at least one of the methodologies we use for that. So Nigel. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Donna. Yeah. I mean, you're familiar, I think, with many of the outputs that Donna's just listed. So we thought what we do, because the time is limited, is focus on a few techniques that we use, uh, but which are perhaps less commonly used in the data quality space. And one example of that are these things called rich pictures, uh, which you may have come across. Uh, originally, they were derived, derived from systems thinking uh, methodologies and disciplines. And in systems thinking uh, is all about solving messy and complex problems. And I think what we've uh, tried to highlight so far, successfully, I hope, is that data quality is a classic messy or complex problem. <clears throat> and it's complex for the reasons listed there. Um, very often, there's a lack of information and hard facts. People know the data is not very good. But if you say how not very good is not very good, as Donna said earlier, we don't know because we never measure it. Um, very often as well, data quality involves large numbers of people, especially in big organizations. So we've come across situations where we talk to the data producers and they say, yeah, the data's fine. We think it's fit for purpose. But then when you talk to the consumers of that data, they go, no, it doesn't meet our needs. Not nearly good enough for what we need. So you get different perspectives and different perceptions of what the problems really are. And then when you do find problems, very often who owns those problems is, is a bit of an unknown. And that little uh, the diagram in the middle there, uh, on the right-hand side with the balls on it, um, those of you who were around in the 1980s might remember that as being called Newton's Cradle. And it was based on Isaac Newton's third law of motion, which is action and reaction are equal and opposite. But in an organization, very often data quality problems are caused at the front end of that chain, but you don't feel the pain until the ball at the back end pops up. And that's because, you know, a bad input of an address at the front end means that somebody at the back end saying dispatch or invoice and what they should send. So that makes the ownership of the problem really difficult. So where we think rich pictures of great value is, is that a great starting point for getting a grip to, on what do we need to focus on because it covers holism. And I think what it does very well as well is highlight how interconnected many problems are in data quality. And certainly we've used these in workshop settings where all you need is a whiteboard, a bunch of colored pens, and you encourage uh, the people in that workshop just to get up to that whiteboard and show or draw in any way they like using a picture, a cartoon, words, whatever, um, how they feel about data quality. 
And the great advantage of doing that is that it's a great and quick way of deriving these things we call problem themes. So we've got an example here that's based on a, on a, on a real company that I had some dealings with a few years ago. And uh, this is a rich picture of a, yes, a, albeit a fictional hotel and casino group, but a lot of the problems were derived from conversations I had with a real hotel group. And uh, if you draw a decent rich picture, which I hope this is, um, you should be able to look at this picture and very quickly at least get a feel for what some of the main sort of problem areas and issues really are. And um, you can see there one or two things. You can see the top middle scale of the, of the organization. Just below that, they've got a new CEO and they've got some new business goals. Um, they've got a lot of duplicate customers and no single customer view. And by doing that, you can then derive these things which we call problem themes. And those are just a few I've highlighted. And the advantage of having problem themes like this, of course, is that then it gives you a starting point to say, okay, if we're going to, these are potential data quality issues that we can start to tackle. So maybe we hit the marketing database first. We need to look at finance data. What do we do about uncontrolled customer data duplication? How do we deal with supply management problems? And I think, again, this diagram is a classic example. If you take, for example, the potential need for IT investment, then that implies that's generally a technology problem. If you look at the, um, the cultural issues about data capture, that seems to be a people problem. There seems to be a problem with, with the culture of people who don't feel that it's part of their job to collect data accurately. And then at the bottom, supply management problem sounds like there's a process issue. And probably in all those three cases, it's a combination of the three, but it gives you a good feel as well for the sort of people, process, and technology issues that you've got to face. And it is a good place to start, I think, in terms of getting that assessment, initial business assessment of the business and some of the problems it's got with data quality. So once you've done that, um, what you can then do is moving on to the step two of that methodology, the B of the A to E methodology, which is to baseline the data. What things like rich pictures and some of those other tools will do is give you a qualitative view of, of, of some of the data quality issues. But I think to, in order to really convince people of the need for action, you then need to supplement this with very much a quantitative view. And as Donna said, it's really important to baseline the quality of some of the key data sources that um, you've discovered in the first stage. And to do this, I think this is all pretty self-evident. You decide which are the key data sources and domains. You profile the data. I'd always recommend using a data profiling tool rather than trying to do it on SQL or Excel for reasons I won't go into now. But you can pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for a data profiling tool, or you can get free versions on the internet. And if need be, start with a free one and then make the case to get something a bit more sophisticated. And then you can assess how good the data is according to the seven dimensions. And I'll come to that in a second. Then you can present the results of that exercise back to your stakeholders, gain consensus on what impact some of those problems are having on the business. And then you can refine this data quality issues log, which as Donna said, could be a spreadsheet. So, you know, potential outputs of all this, you would do some sort of initial report with a lot of numbers in it about how good or how bad the data is. Um, and then you can start to look at some of the potential financial costs and business impacts of the poor data. Then once you've done that, what you can then do is start to actually put some baseline measures together. And this is where the seven dimensions of, uh, of data quality come into play. And why seven? Well, ba well basically, uh, there is no industry standard on what the dimensions of data quality are. I think the important thing to remember is that data quality isn't a sort of a unified entity. There are a number of reasons why data can be of poor quality, and it encompasses all of those things. And the ones in blue we call the content dimensions of data quality. In other words, it's about the data itself and demonstrates that uh, data is multidimensional. So when you're looking at a particular data set, for example, or, 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 a, or a system, you know, how complete is the data? Um, are all the fields populated that should be populated, or are some of them left blank? And I'm sure we've all seen databases where, I don't know, the prefix field is blank, or the postcode or the zip code field is blank. Does that matter? But until you can actually establish that you have blanks in those fields, you can't really ask the question, we've got blanks, does it matter? Then is the data accurate? In other words, does it reflect the real world? So if um, a, an organization holds my physical address, my home address, is that the one I currently live at or is it the one I lived at four years ago? 
Um, the other thing is that very important to measure is how unique the data is. And um, I'm sure every organization we've ever been to has a problem with unintended duplicate records. And in other words, in a marketing database, you might have 100 variations of a client name, which may be a company, because people have input that data have spelt it in 100 different ways. And that's a great testament to people's creativity, but it's pretty hopeless if you're trying to get a single view of that customer as a, as, as, a, as a purchaser of your supplies or services. And then you can look at validity. So things like, you know, is the date of birth in a particular format? The format there is a UK, DDMMYYYY. Maybe you've got both US and UK formats in there. Can you identify the two and do you ever get them mixed up? And then you've got business rules, which says that probably our customers need to be aged between 18 and 120 at a push. Um, if you've got customers younger than 18 or older than 120, there's probably something wrong with that, with that date of birth. And then consistency. So in many big organizations, you know, one of the problems of data quality is that they don't hold a customer data in one place once, unless they've got really good MDM, master data management, but they hold it in very different sets, sets um, platforms and systems. So the key, the key challenge becomes, are those systems consistent? So if my current address is held in one system and is held in eight other systems, do those eight other systems also hold my current address? So have they got out the date addresses? So those are the content uh, dimensions. And then look also, but you need also to look at the context ones, which is simply that if people need access to the data, can they get it and do they and, you know, at all? And we've come across organizations that say, well, we need this data, but for some strange reason, we've been waiting for six months for the IT department to give us access to that data. So we can't do our job properly. And then, of course, the other question is then timeliness. So if you know invoices need to be sent out promptly, then they should be available in the data warehouse at 9 a.m. the following day for that to happen. So you can then make those assessments and then come up, if you like, with a baseline figure for each of those for a data set. And what you can do, if you like, and I've seen some organizations do this, you can roll each of these up um, into a sort of weighted scoring system and come up maybe with an overall score for a data set and say, well, it's a 79 at the moment, it's 85 for accuracy, but only 62 for completeness. So you can start then to derive some measures and then eventually KPIs that Donna will talk about. Um, so I think that's really important. So what I'll do now is hand back to you, Donna, to talk about how you derive KPIs from that. Okay, great. So um, lots we can do on KPIs. Um, one is to, to, to have them. <laughs> that sounds really obvious. And so we can talk a lot about that. Do we have, a, do we have duplicates? Um, is the data valid? Is it incorrect? So. It's good to not only to get a quantitative measure of that, um, but then a target, right? What, what is it? And do that with the business. Do that as part of your data governance council or steward, right? Um, what is the status now? Um, so I think there's a lot of tools that can help with that. Um, but I think one of the key parts is linking that back to the, the first stage in this is what are the business benefits, right? So can you quantify it? Again, one of the ones we find, especially uh, companies that still do physical mail, right? Just think how much you're spending to send physical things to the wrong address. Just stopping that will, you know, help not have the leak. Um, but then not only some quantifiable business benefits, uh, reputation, the, some of the stories uh, Nigel told, didn't make the company look too good. They've lost some trust. So not only do the quantifiable one, absolutely, um, but especially that gut feel of brand reputation. Um, you can't really do great marketing if you don't. I mean, I've had some, obviously, a lot of companies now are trying to go digital um, and then wake up and say, well, we don't even have emails, let alone text message, you know, phone numbers and things like that. So it's really going to limit your ability to be innovative if you don't have the right data. So again, we use the marketing example. It could be anything. We have some companies going to telehealth um, and, and the, the ability to have very safe and secure and correct patient information help them do that very quickly. So again, look at the business driver and that only not helps prioritize what you need to do and set a target that you can achieve and track against. No, but it also helps get buy-in. I saw some of the comments you know, uh, often, often it's really hard to get buy-in from the business. Often this is the absolute easiest thing to get buy-in from the business because they're feeling it every single day. Um, you'll probably get a lot of nodding heads. So you know, we've talked about this next slide a lot that hasn't um, hit home. You know, that idea of you can't manage what you can't measure. And, you know, finance does this all the time. And, and, and money is an asset. Nobody absolutely questions that we have to get a list of how much money the company's making and what the assets and liabilities are. 
it would be a very strange company that didn't have that. Have that. So I think and I, we do see improvement. We, we've done a bit of griping about how long we've been in the industry and still see problems. We still we have seen improvement. I, a lot of our customers um, do have. We'll talk later about the idea of a, a dashboard that monitors. The, the key KPIs around your data assets in terms of is it accurate, is it complete, is it timely, all of those dimensions that Nigel mentioned. So um, do, do track it and, and then do move on with that. So moving through our ABCs, um, then we, we talked about this a bit and we don't want to hit it to death, but you understand the business value, you understand where you are, and then where do you want to go. And do give that some thought. Um, you know, we're probably all familiar with the Pareto principle, which is the 80-20 rule. 20% <laughs> can have the biggest benefit. So what is that 20%? So again, from that issues log, you have some ROI analysis. That should really be something that's bought in from your business stakeholders. It might be really easy. We'll, we'll talk about some tools of how to prioritize that. And again, all of these things sound like they can be big behemoth uh, discussions and long. So much to be from quick little workshops and whiteboarding and some nice templates can really even stopping and ask the questions can go a long way. I think a lot of people say, well, we don't have time to do that analysis. Let's just go do something. Well, gosh, just stop and look at the map for a second or you're not going to get lost. Right? So a lot of these tools and templates we can share with you um, can help with that. Um, and, and just we'll, we'll talk about this in the next slide, but this note here, it isn't always the, the first one you're doing as a group isn't always the highest value, biggest thing, right? Let yourself practice a little bit. Find a quick win that is valuable and that everyone will understand, but might be easy to achieve. So yes, we need to implement a customer master data management system. Absolutely valuable, absolutely beneficial. Uh, probably not the best first thing to start with, right? Can we do something about, can we even get the email addresses, right? You know, can we just um, re reduce the duplicates or something like that? So one, one tool we use um, is a, a quick, um, priority grid. Um, we've done it on a whiteboard. Uh, people bring up sticky notes or, or everyone brings to the meeting a sticky note with their problem. And then as a group, again, this is a, a hand in the, not a detailed analysis of difficulty and level of effort and all that. It really is just a, um, you know, finger in the wind of what's the biggest value um, and, and what's the difficulty. So ideally, you would have the, the lowest difficulty, the highest value would be see sort of the green. Um, the things you probably want to avoid are things that don't have a lot of benefit and are really, really hard. Um, and then some are in the middle. Um, and again, you might, maybe the first one might be a low benefit, low difficulty, or a, a, just to get things started, or a, you know, ideally it's one of these. Um, but give that some thought. And it, these are really interesting workshops, um, especially when done together, because people, and I, I do feel like people can be adults in the room and realize, oh, this was my issue. But you're right. The real thing we need to do is get those addresses right. Let's start with that. And then everyone agrees it together. And it's just kind of a nice getting people up. Um, in the old days, we, we did this in, in person. We've also done things like that pretty successfully um, online. Uh, you can have online workshops that do that as well. So um, I'm going to pass it uh, back to Nigel. Of, okay, now we know what the problem is, where we are, where we want to go, and how we develop this. Okay, thanks. I think it's fairly quickly because I'm conscious of time. Um, basically, uh, this is where you actually now design and implement some improvements. And, uh, and fundamentally, there are three basic things. None of these, I think, are, is rocket science. First of all, you need to create a team of people to tackle these problems. And I think it's really important to get the right stakeholders on board. So, for example, the producers, the consumers of the data, you need IT support. And you may need something like a DPO, uh, for example, if personal data is involved in the project to make sure that you're not doing anything that contravenes GDPR or something else. Um, whenever possible, if you've got data governance, clearly a lot of these things should be led by data owners and, and driven by data stewards on behalf of the data owner. And then you might want to do some reanalysis of the problems you've identified, maybe go into more detail to, to refine things like the ROI, as Donna mentioned, um, and then you design some improvements. Um, those improvements, as Donna said, are often process people and technology changes, but sometimes I've seen really good data quality poor projects that involve nothing more than a bit of re-education of people or nothing more than a tweak to a process um, or creating perhaps one extra feed into a data warehouse. So they don't always have to be really complicated. I think that's the key thing. And again, in terms of outputs and tools, um, you know, we've covered most of that already. But member business case is really important. As Donna said, if you can't relate this to a business outcome, then you shouldn't be doing it. Um, one, of the, one of the tools we use quite a lot at the, in this stage or at the early stages of developing and designing improvements is uh, things called root cause analysis diagrams. 
And here's an example of one from a real organization, which obviously we've anonymized. And um, basically what they do is they show two things. I think, first of all, the interconnectedness, but they also cause, uh, they also model things like causation chains. And this is also comes by the way from systems thinking initially. So you start maybe with poor data quality, which is sort of center, lower, middle. And then you ask the question, right, what causes poor data quality? Well, we've got multiple versions of the truth in our systems. Um, we have silo data and problems are always fixed in silos. Nobody ever looks at the whole thing. And then you go back and says, well, why do we have silo data problem fixes? Because we don't clearly prioritize our data efforts. Why don't we do that? Because we don't have a data strategy or a data architecture. So you can go around and go around in, in, in this model. And it really helps, I think, to understand which you should tackle first. So what you can then do is highlight what, I, what we call the root causes and the outcomes. So if you look at this particular model and start with the yellow um, blobs, which are the outcomes, you can see that the result of bad data quality in this organization is that they have high rework and failure costs. So their costs are higher than they should be as a company. You've lost revenues because of bad customer experiences and ineffective marketing. Uh, because you've got poor data quality, you are risking the wrath of the regulator, um, which uh, is easy for me to say. But then you can also look at, um, and th those end outcomes, by the way, should be the things, if you've drawn this correctly, where you have arrows going into them or causations going into them and nothing coming out of them. And then conversely, the root causes are the ones where arrows go out of them but don't come into them. So if you look at this in terms of where the hell should we start with all of this, then you could argue the first thing we need to do is make business people accountable for data. So let's appoint some data owners and data stewards to lead this work. Or it could be we need a data strategy because we don't understand what data we need to prioritize. Or we maybe we need a data architecture to understand the interconnectedness between the data elements, which is something we can't do at the moment. So again, it's another technique that's a really good starting point for a data improvement project. And then talking about which these, these things start off as projects, as, as, as we mentioned earlier. And once you've identified them, then I think it's really important to plan them properly as projects because you should kickstart them as projects. And um, our way of doing this, very simple way, <clears throat> is something called data improvement planning. So that every single piece of work you do within data quality should have something like this, um, which drives it, which is a data improvement plan, which should have an owner um, and should have many of those elements that you see there on the contents page. And a data improvement plan could either cover a data domain so, for example, you might say, let's figure out how we're going to improve our product data or our inventory data or location data. Or it could be a problem area of the business, like, for example, um, a supply chain process, um, a data literacy of people within the organization. But every initiative that you do should be controlled by these plans. And if you do that, then we believe that the benefits are laid out there on the left hand side. And I won't highlight all these now. Key thing about them, they're not plan they're like every good project plan, they evolve. So as the business changes, the plan should change. The other advantage of having these is that if somebody says, what's our data quality strategy, you can roll up these individual data improvement projects to form in effect a data improvement program, which is the way we tackled this when I worked in BT many years ago. So this is data quality is a good case, I think, where a data quality strategy is sort of top down and bottom up. So that it's the summation, if you like, or the sum of the individual projects that you do um, on the ground that then become the program. So at that point, I hand over the last time to you, Donna, just to finish off. So this last this last phase is often the one folks forget, right? Because we're busy, we fix something, we want to move on to fixing the next thing. But this really, as as Nigel mentioned, isn't a one-time effort. It's a sustainable program. So yes, maybe the initial cleanup, the initial analysis is a project, but how do we keep this and sustain it over time? Otherwise, you're just going to keep cleaning up the same thing. So part of that is accountability and it's part of an ongoing data um, governance program as a business as usual activity. Um, and a nice way to do that, the most of our clients do is have some sort of data quality dashboard, right? So if these are the 10 data elements or data areas, 
that are critical to our business, for every other area of the business, you probably have some sort of, um, you know, the, these uh, charts. Am I, are we on track? Are we right amber green? You know, wh where is there an issue? And so you can proactively start to look at some of these and, and track them. So it's a really nice visual way, um, especially for business users. Just to really, and, and some of the folks you look at these at every single governance meeting and just say, are we on track? If not, what do we do about it? And then don't forget, uh, we, we often do, especially um, folks that maybe, you know, a little modest of, of, of evangelize the benefits of what you did. You, you had a data quality cleanup. You, you showed the ROI. Did you tell your sponsors about it? Did you tell the CEO about it? Did you put it in the newsletter? Did you thank the people who did it, right? And then tell them again. And then each of these, data quality will continue to improve with a bunch of these quick wins that everybody hears about. Um, so really make it part of everyone's job. A, a cute thing. Um, one of my customers did, you know, they kind of had a data centric initiative um, and they had little videos of everyone at their desk. Folks from all of the walks of life that we mentioned, the data entry clerk, the salesperson, um, the product manager, and they, they would be doing something with data and they said, this is what data centric looks like, right? I'm, I'm putting in the right values into the, the field. I'm selling to the customer and I'm getting their email address. This is what data quality looks like. I thought that was really cute um, because it really hit home that this is everyone's job. Data quality is part of your day job. So you don't have to go quite that far with the whole video campaign, but just do keep, keep people aware, keep it their responsibility. And when, they, when we do something right, we all see the value. So just summarizing, because I know we want to move over to questions. Um, I think we've hit home that data quality is complex. Well, because business and organizations are complex, right? Um, and so these, these will always be things we need to look at, just like your finances are something you look at every year at a company, right? It's not like that's a bad thing that data is somehow unique and terrible that we have to keep man managing, right? So you want to look holistically at the people, process, and technology and really start to embed that not only in your governance, but with some very quantifiable plans where you can have those incremental improvements that are really multi-dimensional. Um, before I quickly pass it over to Shannon for questions, um, our typical plug that we do this for a living. So if you need help, do let us know. <laughs> We're happy to help. Um, and then one plug that should be helpful for you. So Nigel just published, hot off the press, um, a blog on data quality and this multi-dimensional approach, which you might be interested in, shares a little more detail about some of those dimensions. And that's out on our website under the blog session. So um, one more plug, please join us next month um, if you're able to on data virtualization, and we'll have a nice chat about that. So Shannon, I would like to pass it over for questions and open it to you. Thank you, Donna and Nigel, so much for this great presentation. But it is, uh, just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder that we, uh, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording and anything else requested. Let me dive in here for, um, for you so with the questions. In, um, for someone who doesn't have access to paid data modeling solutions, what applications would you recommend to make visual data modeling graphics? Um, I'll, I'll take that one, and then Nigel, if you want to chime in. I mean, a data modeling tool is, is, is great. There's some, um, there are some low-cost data modeling tools. They tend to often be on the techie side, but um, good old Visio and PowerPoint can work, especially when you try to tell that story. I almost put some examples in this slide of, you know, put a picture of a customer, um, put some lines towards a customer can buy more than one product, but the website won't let you do that um, or something. So, you know, if you actually don't have a data modeling tool and you're trying to tell the story, like I wouldn't, I would not recommend a PowerPoint for obviously board engineering a database, um, but to just start to tell that story, you could, you could be very creative with some of this stuff. And how do we determine the business benefits of this identified when um, determining the problem theme? Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I could pick that one up, Donna, if you like. I mean, the, the problem theme is, is part of that stage one assessment process. In order to gather a lot of the information that you need to do that process effectively, you know, the way we'd always recommend doing that is, yeah, you can look at documents and other things, but the best, the most effective way of doing it is to talk to people. And um, when you ask people in interviews or in small workshops or small groups, you know, what are your biggest data quality problems and challenges? And then the first, you know, once they tell you what they are, the first question we'd always ask is, okay, how does that impact your part of the business? What problems does it cause you? Can you actually quantify in any shape or form, you know, the impact of those problems on your business in terms of money 
or in terms of loss of customers or anything else. So you sort of gather that information and what the problem themes that, that you extract from the, from the uh, rich pictures then does is simply to help you group those problems in a way to help you tackle them as part of data improvement projects. I love it. Well, you guys, this has been so great. And Nigel, thank you for joining us this month. It's been such a great topic. It's always super hot. Um, but I'm afraid that brings us to the top of the hour. And that is all the time that we have for today. Again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants with links to the slides and links to the recording of this session. Thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We love, always love watching the chat and the questions coming in. So hope everybody has a fabulous day and stay safe out there. Thanks, Donna. Thanks, Nigel. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, all.